All right, are we ready? Yep. Okay, so I have up on the screen the chart that we started uh, talking about last week. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. Um, so last week we got into this and um, we got into talking about how the different parts of Judaism uh, view halacha and the tradition. And we finished the, uh, top, the top line talking about orthodoxy. Uh, anybody have any questions on any of that or any comments before we move on? Okay. Um, I, I want to move now, instead of dealing with the, on, on this chart, he has the four different parts of conservative Judaism. I want to jump down to the last one and talk about reform first. Um, it, do, uh, is anybody, or do you remember, um, back in the days when you were in Hebrew school, the history of the reform movement? Okay, good. In, I know. In, in what detail? That means I, I can talk a lot, and uh, you know, <laughs> I would just go like this, right? Um, the reform movement actually got started in Germany. Germany. Okay. Uh, let me find something here. I just the actually the guy was a um, uh, not a rabbi or not a uh, uh, no. It would have been hard for him to be a rabbi and, and start a reform movement. But anyway, a, a gentleman by the name of Israel Jacobson, uh, he was a, he's listed here as a philanthropist in Westphalia. And he was not very happy with the, um, the way Jewish life was, was the communal Jewish life was taking place at the, at the uh, in the early part of the 19th century. Um, what <clears throat> he there was, I think, two things that that uh, bothered him the most. Well, perhaps more, but that, that uh, when he went to to shul. He found one, the lack of decorum to be very disturbing. And he also was upset by the fact that, you know, Jewish worship didn't play into the norms of the society around him. So he started, remember where is, let me get the name of it. Oh. Okay, don't know what he started. But what he was interested in and what he started was a, a service that borrowed from the churches that were around him in Germany, mostly the Protestant ones. <clears throat> and the features that he liked the best was one, the decorum, uh, to the fact that there was the use of the vernacular, and there was, you know, service, there was a good part of the service that uh, was in German, and that the person who led the service gave what we now call a sermon, um, which was on primarily moral themes, um, and again, delivered in the in German or whatever, you know, whatever vernacular was, uh, was being spoken in that particular place. And he modeled a service, a Jewish service along those lines. Hmm. Oh, by the way, he also thought it was important uh, to have a, an organ and choir. I may be 
I'm going to back up a little bit. I may be attributing too much to Jacobson himself, but these were the features that by the time in a reform congregation was established in July of 1810, these were the primary features of that service. Um, uh, more to just a very quick interruption. Uh, my father was born in Frankfurt in 1912, and he has a picture of himself going to the Orthodox synagogue in top hat and tails. And that was the tradition apparently back then. Well, yeah, and that tradition, um, you know, I, I don't think it was a universal tradition, but I think there were, you know, the, the shuls that I call high church, um, you know, the more formal, the larger ones, the more formal ones, it was very common. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Sephardic congregations were also like that. In Amsterdam, you know, you see many of the pictures of the big shul in Amsterdam where people are in, in top hat and tails. Um, when I was in New York at the seminary, very often I would go down to uh, the Spanish Portuguese on uh, up near, what was it, Central Park West. Um, and the 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 machers, the big shots of the congregation showed up. By that time, they weren't wearing uh, top hats, um, but they were wearing morning coats with the striped pants. Um, yeah. I believe they were wearing bowlers. Uh, maybe, but fancy hat, they, they were dressed, dressed up. Um, and I think the way that they, they talk about that was that, you know, you're going to talk to God. And if you can go talk to God, you, be, you should be dressed up in your finest because, you know, it's like, you know, going and talking to royalty or, or, the, um, um, or the president or, you know, other big shots. Um, and the way I heard it is that they only stopped wearing the type of, that type of formal wear um, when they could no longer... Um, get that type, you know, the material for making that those, uh, those clothes were, became, uh, they stopped making them because nobody, nobody else was buying them. Um, so they stopped. Uh, I believe to a certain extent, uh, Mick Israel did the same thing. I think they were a little quicker to get away from the formal garb. So that um, infers that the only time that you can communicate with God is by being in shul? Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I've never looked up that particular question, so I don't know <laughs> how widespread that was. I say that a little facetiously. <laughs> okay. You're communicating with God all the time because you have to say brachot for everything. Of course. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, but uh, the sense is, um, you know, I think the sense is that here it is, you're going to a formal session where you, you're talking to God. I mean, you know, prayer, prayer services are services to, to talk to God, and, and they felt they should be dressed like that. Um, I, I say that, uh, you know, dressed in my nice uh, Duke t-shirt for today, and I'm not going to tell you, uh, I'm not going to stand up and show you the lack of long pants. Um, but I, but I do have pants on, as short as they are. But in any event, uh, before I get too far afield, um, in the mid in the um, mid nineteenth century, the form movement uh, uh, had come to the United States, and by the mid let me find one thing here. Um, who took who took it to Cincinnati? I can't remember who it was. Uh, in any event. Um, 
we have the establishment of the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. Um, and how did I just do that? I need to zoom back out a bit here. Okay. Um, and which was a, uh, one second here, I need some information. Um, but I know it was established around 1880. Um, and even though the, they took elements, of, uh, they adapted elements of uh, the reform from Germany, you know, their theological position in general is here as the, uh, we have on the chart, um, ignore this approach, exponent of the approach, I'm gonna get back to that one here. Um, but it talked about, their view of, let me get the titles here, their method of study was to distinguish between the, the, the actual biblical text and the um, commentary that went around it. Um, the Torah is God's will written by human beings. As time go on, we get to understand his will better and better. Um, therefore, uh, the nature of, of religious life and religious practice uh, can evolve and can change uh, as we go along. Um, the moral laws, moral laws come from God and most ritual laws have no authorities because they were established, you know, the actual rituals were established by human beings through the years and, and therefore the reform movement took on a greater emphasis of the moral practices in, in, uh, in Judaism than the actual uh, rituals and, and ritual practice. Okay, um, but in Hebrew Union College in the early 1880s, there was a very strong um, division of, of ideas that was broken up into the, uh, probably has a more definitive term to it, but I'm gonna call them the pure reformists. Those who wanted to uh, just reestablish something new or continue with what got started in Germany, uh, as opposed to the traditionalists uh, within the movement who wanted to hang on to, uh, to a lot of the practices and a lot of ideas that they felt were, were nice and they uh, wanted to keep them going. Um, and this was a very heated discussion in the, uh, in the college. And in July of 1883, they had their first graduation. And the, um, Graduation was held in a hotel in um, downtown Cincinnati. Um, and the people in charge had came from the, uh, the, the pure reformists. Um, the Jewish Museum, you know, here in Independence Square has a copy of the menu from that banquet. Um, yeah. and, it's, and it's very telling. Um, the copy I'm reading from actually, the one at the museum, I think is a copy of the actual menu. The one I'm reading from was a reprint from the Cincinnati paper. Um, you know, a, uh, a couple of days later. All right, so the menu started off with little neck clams in the half shell. Well, I, I, some of these names of these foods are in French and I'm having a try to pronounce it. Um, so I was followed with some kind of sherry, then had, had uh, potage and consomme, followed by a sauterne. Then the next course was fish, also filet de boeuf or 
I told you I'm not going to pronounce it. Anyway, beef with mushrooms. So we have fish and beef with mushrooms, soft, uh, soft shell crabs, and shrimp salad. <laughs> okay. Then after a little break for some liqueur, the entree was sweetbreads a la somebody or else in uh, peas a la francais um, and, uh, and another kind of liquor. The next course, which was here to awaken the appetite, had chicken, asparagus sauce, and some and potato pie. What's a Roman punch? Anybody know what a Roman punch is? It just says Roman punch. Um, next came frog legs and a uh, the vegetarians finally got their shot with a, a, a cauliflower roast and other things here, the side dishes that I have no idea what they are. Um, and then finally, well, it says hors d'oeuvres, or the hors d'oeuvres that were served uh, were some kind of olives, sardines, something with mayonnaise. Um, and other various uh, cheeses and fruits and uh, whatever they could that find that was uh, not very kosher. All right, so the reaction to this banquet, which was seen as the turning point between this um, dichotomy between the traditionalist and the pure reformist, um, ultimately led to the beginning of the conservative movement. And I'll, I'm, I'll get back to that later. But the, uh, as these, um, you know, reformists, you know, got control of the college and ultimately got control of the, you know, the movement as it was uh, <laughs> solidifying and uh, I guess you could say reforming itself or forming itself. Um, and they got to a point where they needed to establish what exactly were their principles. So this led to 1885, where we have the Pittsburgh platform, um, where they laid out in a written document what it is that the reform movement stood for. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you a, 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 uh, a brief, try to be a brief synopsis of eight main points. Um, the first one is that a recognition that um, in every religion, an, an, an attempt to grasp the, there is an attempt to grasp the infinite. Uh, every mode, source, or book or revelation held sacred in any religious system, the consciousness of the indwelling of God and man. So first they did recognize that there is, that there is a God. Good way to start, right? Second, that the Bible is a record of the consecration of the Jewish people to its mission as priests of the one God. So they recognize that the, the Bible does have a special status. And uh, I don't know if they, um, well, and now I'm, I'm going to skip what I was going to say, because I don't think I can, can back it up. But anyway, uh, that they felt that the um, modern scientific discoveries, rather than contradicting biblical accounts, really, you know, showed how the miraculous tales of divine intervention came about rather than conflicted with them. Um, the Bible reflecting the primitive ideas of its own age and at times closing its conception of divine providence and justice dealing with man in miraculous narratives. Okay, 
if this gets too highfalutin in language, stop me and I'll try to paraphrase. Third, we recognize that in Mosaic legislation, a system of training the Jewish people for its mission in the national life in Palestine. And today we accept as binding only the moral laws and maintain only such ceremonies as elevate and sanctify our lives. I think, I think that was a biggie. Um, you know, but they, they had it third because they felt that it was po first important to recognize that they, that they did believe in God and they felt that there was uh, some uh, importance to the biblical narrative. Fourth, <clears throat> we hold that all such Mosaic rabbinical laws as regulate pr diet, priestly purity, and dress originated, um, let me just say, originated under human, um, you know, human providence. You know, and uh, the last, I think the last four will just take off on these points, but I think we have here the main parts of the, the platform that the moral law is, is dominant um, the sacred texts that we have were done by humans and open to interpretation and reinterpretation and could evolve and change as we, as we go along. Um, this basically was the, the, uh, the underpinning of the reform movement. Um, it, in the uh, 20th century, it was felt that there needed to be a little bit of uh, updating of these uh, of principles. And we have the 1937 guiding principles, um, which were uh, done in Columbus. There was a meeting in Columbus that the, you know, the guiding principles came out of and had the, uh, it's still called the 37, you know, guiding principles, but made some modification of the Pittsburgh platform. And for the mo most part is still the basic, the basic principles of the reform, reform movement. Okay. Um, did I run through that too fast or any questions or we're good where we stand? I think the, um, <clears throat> for me, the underpinning of the reform movement has always been about one thing and one thing only, and that's assimilation. Uh, I think it's, <clears throat> it began and it has continued um, being motivated by a, a need to feel a part of whatever national uh, culture um, surrounds it. Uh, and I think the, the, the menu is a, you know, <laughs> the menu speaks for itself. I think, uh, I think they wanted, they had something to prove there. And, and that is that we're not, you know, we're not these weird people off here, you know, with the prayer shawls and the tefillin and we are, you know, we eat shrimp. I think that that was the, um, I think that's, that's always been the, the, uh, the underpinning. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there was uh, I, the only, I'm, I'm going to be a little hesitant to use the word assimilation because I always take the word assimilation to mean that you're really um, melting into the woodwork. And I think that early reform wanted to be more accepted by the general population and, uh, and, and adopted many of their uh, what do you say, cultural norms. Um, but I don't think they wanted to completely, you know, get into that woodwork. And I think they wanted to hold on to a certain part of their Jewishness. And uh, if anything, you know, I, I think assimilation implies they, that they, they didn't. But I overall, I agree with that, that they're, they, I mean, I, I think Jacobson was very, um, 
you know, blunt about it. I mean, his, his idea was to, to be, you know, you know he, he wanted his shul to be just like that church on the corner. Um, and I think even if you look at the early um, synagogue architecture of the time, you know, what's the difference? You know, the only way you can tell the difference between a church and, and the shul is look up at the, uh, at the spire on the top. If it has a cross, it's a church. If not, it's a shul. Uh, or look at the stained glass windows. Um, yeah. If you listen to the music, um, <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I you know, wrote, wrote of Shalom, where I'm still an associate member. Uh, in the, the opening hymns on the High Holy Days, uh, you wouldn't know. I mean, uh, you wouldn't know that you weren't in a church. It, it's it sounds like you know it's right on a Bach or Handel. It's it, it doesn't have any any of that that um, you know the the either Sephardic or or Ashkenazic sensibility that you know you you, you, don't, you don't hear any melody that would uh, you'd associate with Judaism. It sounds like a hymn. Okay. Uh, uh, so long, guys. I've got another meeting. I can't get this chat thing to post itself. Uh, see you people. Bye. Bye, Jenny. Bye, Jenny. Bye, Jenny. So when I went to Rodaf 20 something years ago, the Rabbi Weiss was still there. He was like, just had retired as Rabbi Emeritus. The guy goes, hard to recognize the service from what we have in conservative movement. But now when I've been to a couple of reform bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs. People wear talits and you know yeah. keep out. Things are like yeah. I mean, the early like the early part of the twentieth century. Um, a reform, you know, I don't know if I still have it handy, but if you look at the Union Prayer Book, you know the early ones, the ones that were really small books, um, very little Hebrew. Um, almost uh, nothing in there. Everything was in English, um, with the exception maybe they sang the Shema and a couple other things. Um, the turning point, uh, I don't know if this is uh, officially recognized in the um, reform history, but the turning point was 1967 in the Six Day War. Uh, I mean, am I the only one old enough to remember the Six Day War here? No, I remember I, it. I remember it well. Yeah, we all remember it. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, I'm old I, enough not to remember it. I, I, <laughs> Tanya has not I got her herself hidden, so I don't know if she's uh, remembering it or just uh, giving us. I read about it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming home. Like from Hebrew school, and my mother like listening to news radio because they kept updating it. Um, what was the guy's name? Jay Bushinsky. He was the yeah. Yeah. Middle yeah. East guy. He was like right giving updates constantly on news radio. Uh, the um, but in any event, the you know the Six Day War. You know the re the result of it was this tremendous, um, uh, what's the word I want, uh, increase of Jewish sensibilities, the, uh, a sense of Jewish identity, and, um, and you know, doing anything Jewish, you know, because, you know, the Jews were no longer the underdog, were no longer the, uh, the, the, the whipping post, and what came out of that in, in some subtle ways was the traditionalizing of the reform movement. Um, you know, my contemporaries at the time that were going through uh, Hebrew Union College and, at the, and uh, Jewish Institute of Religion, which is now part of HUC, um, and, and, and getting into their congregations were, were Putting more Hebrew back into the uh, their service uh, were uh, well. Some some congregations even moved their main service from Sunday to Saturday. You know, in the early reform that was heretical. Um, you know, when I grew up, 
the largest Reformed congregation in Cleveland is called The Temple. Uh, it, the rabbi was Abba Hillel Silver, and he gave his main service on Sunday morning, and the place was packed. Always the people would come to hear him speak. I never did, but I'm told. As, as, a, as a former Clevelander, though, I would say he was one of the few great Zionist rabbis in the Reform movement. Um, he was one of the great rabbis in any movement. Yes, and he was a very, yeah, he was very well known. Um, Big Zionist. Big Zionist. Uh, his speech at the UN was uh, was uh, was heralded all over the place. But anyway, his his service was on Sunday morning, um, and after '67, the you know the Reform movement has come over, and so then the he when the uh, Union Prayer Book was. Uh, was reissued or or re reconsidered. I believe there it came out in uh, early seventies at one point. Um, that the that prayer book uh, was the first to give uh, alt alternate variations of the service. That in the prayer book you have you know. One that's heavily English, as the old, similar to the old uh, he, uh, Union Prayer Book, probably with updated English. Uh, you contrasted that with one that was uh, the Hebrew text out of a traditional prayer book, and then other variations that uh, would offer different Hebrew English uh, readings and uh, and prayers throughout the service. Um, so. And I, and I believe the uh, the newer editions. I don't think they call it Union Prayer Book anymore. I, I don't know what's. I don't have a copy of it. But uh, uh, Gates of Prayer, right? Mort, Mort, there's another pressure also that's been on the reform movement recently, and that is starting in the sometime in the late '70s, early '80s. There's been a movement of conservative Jews away from conservative synagogues towards reform uh, temples. And I think uh, they've had an influence on the uh, reform movement, making them a little move a little more uh, towards uh, Hebrew, towards you know what the conservative services were. Uh, could be. I don't know. I, I know today there, there's a there's a, a large drop in in conservative membership. Yeah, there's been a large drop, but uh, I'm not sure that there's been. A corresponding raise uh, in reform. That reform has gone a little bit stronger. I, I don't have absolute data on that. I, you know, I, I could say it could be some moved over. Uh, I think some some conservative Jews also went to Reconstructionism, but um, but yeah, there's been a lot of influences. But and, you know, and look, reform movement was the first to um, to ordain women. Or first of all, to admit them into rabbinical school, and then to uh, you know to ordain them as rabbis. Um, they were they were very strong on um, recognizing um, those of uh, different sexual orientation to become involved uh, in, both in their communities and into the rabbinical school and rabbinic leadership. Um, you know, and on and on. I, you know, and I, and I think that, uh, you know, that my, my point right now is just to to talk about them as uh, you know part of our multifaceted Jewish community, but also in the historic contents context of that we're dealing with of how, you know, we basically had a traditional system. They came and took it in modern parlance more to the left and um, and did all the things that they're doing um, without making any judgments of uh, you know what it's like or you know you know what the services are I, I, I've anytime I've been to a forum congregation uh, it's usually been for a uh, an ofro for a uh, barabat mitzvah 
you know, the one that my, uh, where my granddaughter became a bat mitzvah was wonderful. Uh, I'm not sure that I would say that the, uh, I mean, but then I was prejudiced at that one. I'm not sure that I'm completely comfortable in other ones. Um, but be that as may, there are obviously some people who are. What I mentioned before, and I want to finish up with this and just mention it, and uh, next week we'll deal with it, uh, you, know, you know, in more detail. But I said how the Trey banquet ultimately led to the, to the establishment of the conservative movement. Um, because what happened is that that faction in HUC, which was part of the, you know, which we call the traditionalist, uh, were, left, were left high and dry. They had no place to go. And it, after a couple of years, um, some of them got together and said, well, we've got to do something about it. Anybody want to take a guess where they got together? It wasn't Cincinnati, it wasn't Pittsburgh. Philadelphia? Yep. Ah, yep. Arlene, uh, amazing. <laughs> the, um, there was a, I'm not sure he was the rabbi at McPhee Israel, but he was involved in McPhee Israel, a man by the name of uh, Sex, Sex, I never figured out how to pronounce his name. S E X A I S, I think it was. Uh, how do you how do you say it? Sacious. Sacious. It was a great tennis player. Sacious. Vic Sacious was a great Jewish tennis player. Yeah, I never realized he was Jewish. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, Moraes was uh, got some people together. And they, um, they said they needed to, uh, to do something. And their idea was, yes, it's, um, it's good to modernize. We want to bring in some aspects of the society around us. Um, but we don't want to uh, dive off the deep end like the people behind the Traif dinner. So they wanted to conserve the aspects of traditional Judaism while, while having the other foot in modernity and thus became the conservative movement, um, you know, after a few, after they got, got things started. Um, and their way of doing it was to establish the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, actually, they established a, uh, a school in New York. I have, it, didn't do well for the first couple of years. And then they reformed it as the Jewish Theological Seminary. And we'll get into that more as we go on. More, when was the meeting in Philadelphia? What was it? When was it? Um, give me a second to look that up. Um, was it at Lou Tendler's restaurant? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm I'm not even sure that it was as an official meeting as some of these others. Um, uh, let me see here. I don't have that offhand. I mean, I know that Beth Israel was started in 18, I'm going to say 25, 1830, sometime in the, I think before 1850, as 
a tradi- I guess a, tra- a traditional, what we probably would have called orthodox um, shul for German Jews who did not like Road of Shalom and didn't feel comfortable at the Sephardi Mikveh uh, Israel. And it was the third synagogue in Philadelphia. At least that's the way they tell me that the way I remember learning the history of the synagogue. Beth Zion, of course, doesn't get started until the 1950s. But Beth Israel was one of the founding congregations of the conservative movement. But I just don't know when, when, that, when that was. I think it was, when we went, it was in 1840. Yeah, it's in Charles Ludwig's history. That he, Charles Ludwig wrote a history of the synagogue. But did, but did they but did, but it started more orthodox. I think so. Well, I think it was forty was an orthodox. Yeah. It was right, definitely let me, let me just uh, give you uh, read this little short passage. Um, you know, the trafe banquet could possibly be excused as an oversight, but the Pittsburgh platform. For us, the few non-reformed Jews in the United States of the 1880s to realize exactly how much they disagreed with the direction of the reform movement. Consequently, they came together to take steps to combat the increasing reform influence. The group included very traditional Sephardic Jews led by Rabbi, and I got his first name wrong, I apologize. It was Sabato, S A B. Sabato Moraes of Philadelphia and Rabbi Pereira Mendez of New York. It also included reformers with a more modern type who disagreed with the Pittsburgh platform, men like Marcus, Rabbi Marcus Jastro of Philadelphia and Rabbi Alexander Kohat of New York. These rabbis, together with a number of important laymen, succeeded in creating a rabbinical school called the Jewish Theological Seminary, which opened up in 1887. Okay, so the, the first version of the seminary was 1887. I thought it had a different name at first, but I guess, you know, I'm rethinking my, I got to go back and take some of my history classes again, I guess. Um, but, you know, I don't think, I have a feeling that I'm not sure that there was a, a formal um, meeting such as the one that was in Pittsburgh or in Columbus or others that established this movement. Uh, I think it was since a lot, most of them were either Philadelphia or New York. I think they just kind of uh, initially began with informal discussions and then decided their formal step would be the uh, establishment of the seminary. Okay, I think this gets us to the point that's going to be, you know, get us into uh, the four lines on the uh, chart here of the different aspects of conservative Judaism. One one thing the conservative Jews took from reform is. Um, Sephardic Hebrew. Uh, the Reform Movement rejected the Ashkenazi Hebrew of the Orthodox. Mm. And so, and the Conservative Movement took that. And I think um, Ben Gurion, being Reform, um, took uh, Sephardic Hebrew as the language of Israel and not Ashkenazi. I, I think Ben Gurion would argue with you calling him Reform. Well, he's not reform. He wasn't affiliated. He was anti-religious. Yeah, so I'm not going to call him reform at all. Well, um, whatever. But he was anti. So yeah. I, I tell you, I, re- I remember when the when more conservative shul starting to adopt Sephardic pronunciation, and at the time I didn't have any sense that it was directly coming from reform. I think it was more of Zionistic feelings. Uh, of the of the fifties that caused it to happen rather than uh, you know pulling off of the reform movement. Oh yeah, um, now that I think of it, I remember that in the fifties. I, I remember my synagogue having both Ashkenazi and Sephardic Hebrew, and then moving over to Sephardic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, and I think that the um, both reform, well, no, actually the reform movement was very slow to pick up really pure Zionistic feelings. There were there were some congregations that were anti-Zionist, um, you know, amongst the reform. Uh, they um, they were doing, you know, you had leaders like Abba Hill of Silver in some congregations that were were very involved in the Zionist movement, but some that were were antagonistic to it. Um, you know, I think you could sum it up by saying they were afraid of being uh, accused of dual loyalties and, um, you know, and stayed away from it. So, yeah, but there, there I, I think, I think there's a, there are several things that uh, we, we borrowed from the reform. I think the idea of the sermon, uh, you have uh, early, early part of conservatism, conservative services were very much focused on the element of decorum. Uh, you know, um, responsive readings, um, you know, throw in a little, you know, well, definitely throw in the English, that was part of it. Um, mixed seating, mixed seating was a big one too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there was a bunch of things going on. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks, Mort. It's great. Yeah, this is very interesting. Good stuff, Mort. Thank you. All right. I think, I think at this rate, um, no, the, the conservative talking about some of these conservative probably only take to get through the four lines probably only two weeks. <laughs> okay. That's all right. We're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. And, um, you know, since I can uh, point to uh, Art's question of getting us started on this, and I always say I'd rather talk about what you guys want to talk about than what I want to talk about. So uh, that's fine. And I enjoy it. All right. That's great. Have a good